So the sampling distribution of the mean is normally distributed, right? We just saw that in the definition, right? As n increases, we take larger samples, it approaches normality more rapidly, right? We just saw that samples of five versus 25. Normally when you hit 25 or 30, you're good, right? So the sampling distribution can be described simply by the mean and the standard error, which is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So the mean is the mean of the sample means, right? Which we were just seeing in our graphic. It will equal the population mean, which is the long-term expected value, right? So if you take just one sample mean, sampling error dictates that it's probably not going to be the population mean. But if I take the mean of sample means, central limit theorem dictates that that will equal the population mean, okay? The standard error or the standard deviation of the sample means, right, which is the standard error of the mean, okay? Remember, standard errors are standard deviations of sample statistics. And in this case, it's the mean. And this equals the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And we just saw that in our simulator as well, right? Okay, so these two values can describe a sampling distribution in its entirety. And so the law of large numbers, if you remember, says that as n approaches infinity or the observed value approaches the expected value, this means when we get larger sample sizes, the sample mean will more closely approximate the population mean, assuming equality in all other things. So large samples are generally going to provide better estimates so long as the sample is randomly selected from the population and therefore likely to be representative. This is an important distinction because if I take a sample of 5 million people who live in, you know, the cons most conservative part of Texas and try to use that to estimate who's going to win the presidential election, that is a biased sample. It's not representative and it's not randomly selected, right? So a sample of 5,000 randomly selected Americans would be a better estimate than 5 million, right, that are selected from a, in a biased way. So more important in sampling is how you take your sample, but assuming the samples are selected in the same probabilistic fashion, larger sample sizes can be expected on average, right? Probabilistically, they will provide better estimates of the expected value. So getting those large enough samples, samples of 25, samples of 30, does a great job of really allowing us to move into then inference. Like people think I got to have like 2 million people. The other mistake people often make is assuming that what matters, you got to think about, well, how big is your population? And in fact, that doesn't matter. So saying that I have 120 million voting Americans means that I need a larger sample to describe them is just untrue. Um, because if you note, the sampling distribution is unaffected by the population size. The size of the population has no impact on the sampling distribution. So that margin of error, the tightness of the distribution, the standard error, like that stuff is unaffected by the size of the population. It is only affected by the size of the sample. So a sample of size 100 is not a worse, est worse way of estimating if there's 100 million people than if there's, you know, 2,000 people, right? So this is important to realize that the precision of these estimates is independent of the population size, okay? So... When we're talking about doing these things, getting a sufficiently large sample will be enough to assume that the behaviors that we expect this of the central, based on the central limit theorem of the sampling distribution of the mean are being adhered to, and that we can use it uh, as an approximate to do tests against expected population values. And so that's exactly what the Z test does, which is kind of our first test. So here we're trying to test sample means, right? And a z-test is just like a z-score, except one thing changes, and that is you have to use the standard error. So the z-score was a score minus the mean divided by the standard deviation of the sample scores. Well, now, if I want to know if a mean is weird, so my go back to my example with, you know, the people who are depressed. I got 100 people with an average of 24 on the BDI, and I expect them to have 31. Right now, the Z test here assumes two things. It assumes that you know the population values for the distribution. So those values in the in the central limit theorem, the mean and the variance, the Z test assumes you know the population mean and you know the population variance. A lot of times in the real world, we don't know either of these things. But here, the Z test assumes we have them. 
So we're going to realize the Z-test often doesn't work. And next week, we're going to talk about alternatives because it doesn't always work. But assuming you know, which means in, in your book, you're going to be given things that say, assume a population has a mean of, you know, whatever, and a standard deviation of whatever. So it's going to tell you that, right? So assuming you know the population mean and you know the population variance or standard deviation, you go get your sample mean, right? And you take your sample mean and you subtract the population mean and you divide by the standard error, which is the population standard deviation divided by the square root of your sample size. So the Z test has two population values and two sample values. You need your sample mean and you need your sample size, but you need to know that is be given the population mean and the population standard deviation. So that is a Z test. And what it does is it allows you to find the probability of a sample mean, right? What's the probability my sample would score 24 or lower, right? I want the tail, right? I might do a two-tailed test, right? But what's the probability of getting this kind of score assuming the population mean is 31, okay? So problems might look like this. Okay, so say in U.S. college students that debt is normally distributed with a mean of 3,173 and a standard deviation of 1,120, okay, dollars. What is the probability that one, so that's one problem, and 25, that's another problem, randomly selected college students would have an average debt less than $2,700? So in one question here, I'm asking, okay, I got one person who's a college student. They belong to the population. That one person has a debt of $2,700. What's the probability of that? Okay. And so here, less than, so we want the left side because they're on the low side, right? What's the probability of it? Okay, that's one problem. That is a Z score. It's one person. Now, a Z test is the second one. Assume I have 25 randomly selected college students and the average for them is $2,700. Now, if you remember, the population distribution, the scores are going to be much more variable than the means. So what that means to us is scores that belong to samples, that is their means, their statistics, are going to become extreme more quickly, right? Because we're going to expect sample means to be closer to the population mean than we expect any single individual score because the standard error of the sample means is going to be smaller, right? As a function of your sample size, the standard error is going to be smaller than the standard deviation of the population scores because it's the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So that means it will always be smaller if you have a sample than, right? But sample of size two is going to shrink it less than a sample of size 100, right? Because if you say you got a sample of size four, then you take the standard deviation and you divide it by the square root of four, which is two. So then I'm just going to split this value in half. So it's still smaller, right? But if I have a sample of size 100, take the square root of 100, that's 10. I divide this by 10. I'm now going to move the decimal place. That's a much smaller number, right, compared to the original. So as a function of your sample size, that standard error is going to be that proportion smaller, right? It's going to be proportionally smaller than your population scores standard deviation. So what that means is this number is going to be more extreme if it belongs to 25 people as an average than it is one person. And if you think about this, it should make some intuitive sense. So if I asked you a question like this, which is less likely? Is it less likely to meet one person who is six foot seven today? Or is it less likely to meet a group of 25 people? The average height for the group is six foot seven. Which of those two events is less likely to happen today? And hopefully what you realized is it is much more probable that you would bump into one person who happens to be six, seven today than that you would bump into 25 people, all of whom are so tall that the average height of the group is six foot seven. If you meet a group like that and they don't play professional basketball, they should, right? So it is crazy unlikely to find 25 random people to have an average height of six, seven in the human distribution of height. We would assume that because it's so improbable, there's something unique about them, like they're professional basketball players, right? Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. 
like this is getting at something that hopefully is intuitive to you regarding the probabilities of individual observations versus group averages, right? That having extreme group averages is much less likely than having individuals who happen to have extreme scores. Okay. So try to work these two out. I'll post some, I'll post options for you to try to test out your abilities and see what you get. So you can see if you're getting the right kinds of answers for these types of problems.